Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for Discovery Automation Enhancements, enabling NVMe OF IP-based fabric systems, um, an NVMe Express sponsored webinar. We'll get started in here in just a moment. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks again for joining us for Discovery Automation Enhancements enabling NVB OF IP based fabric systems. I'd like to take a moment here to introduce you all to our speakers. We have Curtis Ballard, who's a distinguished technologist at HPE. We have Claudio DeSanto, who is a distinguished engineer at Dell, and then Eric Smith, who is also a distinguished engineer at Dell. Um, just as a note for folks to these webinar slides uh, will be available on the NVM Express website after this webinar wraps up and we'll have a recording available here on Bright Talks and on the NVM Express YouTube channel. And with that, I'll pass it off to our presenters. We may have some audio problems, it seems. Um, Eric, are you presenting this one? I can, okay. Can you guys hear me now? Eric, yes, yeah. you were muted. That's so strange, because I was, un okay. <laughs> well, let me go back. Um, sorry about that, everyone. So, um, the agenda that we'll be going over is NVMe over fabrics, technology overview and discovery. Um, then Curtis will be talking about discovery types and uh, uh, centralized uh, versus direct. And then Claudio will be going over NVMe over fabric zoning. My name's Eric Smith, um, because I know I missed that at the beginning. Uh, so NVMe over fabrics uh, is built around discovery controllers. And this has been the case since the base functionality for NVMe over fabrics was released in, in version 1.0. Um, the discovery controller is a single location that reports all known NVM subsystem interfaces. Um, and the, what discovery controllers do is simplify basic discovery administration. Uh, and this is because a single discovery controller um, IP address can provide information about um, subsystem interfaces for multiple subsystems or arrays if you were to come up with a, a mechanism where they could share that information between them. Uh, also within discovery and, and NVMe over fabrics, we have this concept of a referral, which is uh, where a discovery controller is allowed to point to other discovery controllers. So you can get into this hierarchy of discovery if you wanted to do it that way. Um, but a common implementation today, and certainly Dell subsystems are this way, is uh, every storage subsystem contains a discovery controller that only describes interfaces on that subsystem. And um, one of the limitations in NVMe or Fabrics and that Claudio, myself, uh, Curtis, and, and many others um, have worked to, to rectify is that until recently, there was no standard method for hosts or subsystems um, or discovery controllers for that matter to register information with a single discovery controller. 
and uh, and we wanted to solve that problem, and we did. Um, and I'll, we'll go into those details here. Um, the information that oh, let me see. Okay. So I think I'm missing a slide, but okay. <clears throat> so. Uh, in terms of terminology that we're going to be talking about uh, just really quickly through this presentation, there's this concept of a CDC called a centralized discovery controller. And you're going to hear us mentioning this uh, several times. It's actually a big part of the enhancements that we added to 8010. Uh, that's technical proposal 8010, which is a NVM Express uh, uh, document that describes an enhancement to the standard. Um, so that's the centralized discovery controller. But you're also going to hear us talking about um, uh, endpoints. So those are hosts and storage ports. Um, we call um, uh, storage ports uh, subsystems um, in in uh, the, the standard terminology. Uh, we have an IP network um, that's intended to connect hosts and storage ports together. Um, typically, that's 25 gig capable and above. Uh, we also have the concept of, again, that centralized discovery controller. But within the centralized discovery controller, there are centralized discovery controller instances where each instance can be thought of as a um, the set of fabric services that would be provided to a, a single ip based SAN. So if if you're familiar with Fiber Channel, um, there's a SAN A, SAN B concept. You could have one CDC instance associated with SAN A, the other CDC instance associated with SAN B. And we also have a concept of a direct discovery controller or a DDC. And this is the discovery controller that typically resides on the subsystems. So just wanted to put that terminology out there to avoid confusion later on. When we started looking at how to add um, automated discovery to NVMe over fabrics, and that was a big part of the work that we did, we wanted to make sure that we supported three basic types of um, uh, deployments. Uh, the first was physically connected, where you have a host that's physically connected to a subsystem, and we wanted to make the discovery of that DDC that that host is connected to is as straightforward as possible, um, and and also to be able to support other types of topologies in a, in a similar way without having to have a user d d uh, explicitly define the type of uh, deployment type that they were using. So. Uh, to that end, we also defined uh, how to support direct discovery, and that's uh, deployment type two, where you have multiple hosts connected to uh, uh, an IP fabric, and um, you have subsystems also connected, and and there's no there's no centralized discovery controller here. It's all just the discovery controllers on the arrays or on the subsystems. Um, and then the third type of deployment that we wanted to support was this centralized discovery concept where multiple hosts and subsystems will interoperate with a centralized discovery controller. And you can get this concept of end-to-end -end discovery automation uh, where each host can access the subsystems it's supposed to and only those subsystems. Um, okay, so those are the three basic deployment types. And we, we, we were successful uh, in getting uh, support for all three of these deployment types added. Um, so when we talk about the, the different types of configuration and, and discovery uh, that are, are possible with NVMe over fabrics, just want to take a step back and look at what happened before we added um, some additional capability into the spec. Um, so I'm going to talk about TP Technical Proposal 8009 and TP 8010. Um, and uh, in this, and, and this is before either of those, you know, either of those two technical proposals existed. So. What you would what you would initially do is you would, uh, you know, the host admin would configure a host to con connect to a discovery controller on the subsystem at a particular IP address. Um, next step that would happen would be the storage admin would provision namespaces or storage to the host NQN, and then and then um, the host admin can now discover and connect to I/O controllers on the subsystem, and then you would repeat these steps. Uh, on all hosts for each subsystem that they want to connect to. And this doesn't really scale very well. Um, it's a lot of manual configuration at the at the host side and at the subsystem side. So one of the, again, one of the, I, I was talking about direct discovery in the previous slide. Uh, so if we were just to add support for TP8009, which is um, which was a technical proposal that described how a host could automatically discover discovery controllers. Um, the, the, the discovery process would be enhanced slightly, and that's uh, uh, as shown here. Basically, 
when the storage subsystem comes online or if the host comes online after the storage subsystem, they can use MDNS um, to discover each other. In this case, I've got the MDNS um, announcement coming out from the DDC and saying, hey, I've got a, I've got a discovery control over, over here. Here's my IP address. And the host will pick that up and automatically, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's an appropriate client deployed on the host, um, connect to the discovery control, the direct discovery controller at the IP address that they discovered via MDNS. And when I say an appropriate discovery controller, I mean, there are, you know, um, you know, uh, there are operating systems out right now that support NVMe over fabrics using TCP, um, you know, specifically, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the major ones that you'd expect, DSX, Linux, um, and they, they all have discovery clients that are capable of supporting MDNS. Uh, the next step would be for once, the disc once that connect happens automatically, the storage admin would provision namespaces to the host, and then um, the host would receive an asynchronous event notification from the DDCs, retrieve the list of I.O. controllers on that subsystem, and then connect to them. And then you'd basically perform the same steps um, for every host uh, on every subsystem. And so the, the key piece here is that the, the, ad the administrator didn't have to supply the IP address of the direct discovery controller, it was provided, it was discovered automatically through MDNS. So that's with TP8009. And now the, the problem with TP8009 is that if you have multiple direct discovery controllers or multiple subsystems in the environment, every single one of them will advertise, uh, if they support, of course, this 8009, every single one of them will advertise the fact that they support um, a discovery controller or that they're a discovery controller. And um, <clears throat> the host will detect these IP addresses as an attempt to connect to all of them. And that can create uh, uh, some, some uh, scalability issues, especially when you know it's like full mesh discovery. Every host will discover every direct discovery controller. And that might not, but that might not be what you want in a large configuration. So uh, we, we created this concept of a centralized discovery controller to help uh, address that. Uh, so the centralized discovery controller, um, it's, it's just a discovery controller, it happens to be located centrally in the network somewhere, um, where, and by centrally mean all host and subsystems can get to it. And what ends up happening is the host and subsystems will automatically discover the CDC, uh, connect to it and register their discovery information with it. And the great thing is now that all that information is in the CDC, uh, a, 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 an admin can go and perform zoning like you would see uh, with fiber channel and uh, so the so once the zoning is done the host has been given access to specific subsystem interfaces uh, all of a sudden the uh, the that's great then the storage I mean, can provision namespaces to the host NQN uh, alternatively instead of manually configuring the zoning on the the, the the CDC in step one the storage admin after they provision the namespaces could uh, send zoning information to the CDC and and have the zoning updated automatically. That uh, that functionality is called subsystem-driven zoning. And so, whether the zoning is provided done manually or through subsystem-driven zoning, once the zone uh, configuration has been activated, an asynchronous event notification is sent out by the CDC. The host is able to retrieve the log page using get log page and then connect to each I/O controller and then repeat those steps for every host. And so the, the advantage of using a CDC, that again was defined in TP8010, um, is to give um, uh, the, the host the ability to get everything they need for discovery from a single location. This avoids that full mesh discovery. Uh, it also allows you to reduce the number of um, uh, dis discovery controllers that each host would need to interact with uh, for security purposes as well. So just to summarize sort of direct, ver uh, what I would call manual versus automated and centralized discovery at scale, um, you know, if, if you have manual, which is the very first one that I showed you, no 8009, no 8010, um, you know, there are, there are uh, specific discovery steps. And then the automated discovery of CDC configuration steps, again, that's the one that I showed you last. And if we compare them together, um, you know, we've, we've sort of in our lab have noticed that it it gets a little bit uh, difficult to manage um, uh, an NVMe over fabrics environment if you're uh, if you're trying to do manual that first method I showed you and you're you've got somewhere north of 32 hosts I just got I chose 64 because that was a really easy number to work with 
um, because definitely a 64, it's very hard to manage that many individual hosts uh, without some sort of centralized discovery. It's a lot of uh, updates you have to make. Um, and it basically comes down to uh, needing to interact with every host every time a storage system subsystem is added or removed. Um, and the final point that I'd make here on this slide is that the reason that we like, again, the centralized discovery controller uh, approach is that it, it solves uh, a scalability issue that, um, that you get into if you're only using uh, direct or uh, the, the direct discovery controllers without a centralized discovery controller. So it leads to extended discovery times if you do full mesh discovery. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Curtis to get a little bit further into centralized discovery. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, so this slide kind of summarizes some of the things that Eric has introduced already for you in, in his earlier slides and, <clears throat> excuse me, has a, a few additional points about it. So as uh, Eric showed in his uh, second and third examples, we've created automated discovery, centralized discovery, and you'll hear in a little bit about zoning. Uh, and these were capabilities that were designed and developed together inside NVM Express, but different environments have different needs, and especially the discovery automation and the centralized discovery, uh, they do not depend upon each other. Uh, you know, as the first bullet here says, the discovery automation does not depend entirely upon centralized discovery controller. The other way works as well. In Eric's example, he showed you one with the uh, discovery automation without a centralized discovery controller. You can also do centralized discovery controller without the discovery automation, depending on your environment and your requirements. In smaller scale environments, you can make use of MDNS as described in the TP8009 that, that Eric introduced to automatically discover any NVMe discovery controllers. He didn't explicitly call that out, but that discovery controller can be the, the centralized discovery controller the host can automatically discover there's a centralized discovery controller out there. Uh, or if you don't have a centralized discover, it can use MDNS to automatically discover the uh, direct discovery controllers. And that's a standard discovery mechanism, DNS, SD. Uh, so we, we didn't invent something entirely new that has to be uh, implemented on hosts. Uh, a lot of networks allow that, some don't. Uh, and But if you don't introduce the centralized discovery controller, you can use the automated discovery controller, but you don't get the advantages of centralized control, which as Eric was showing in his last slide there, and the scalability is a little bit harder, there's more more setup. And the, the second bullet here is, is the one that's really interesting. When you introduce a new storage subsystem into the environment, your hosts don't find out about it. Uh, people work with fiber channel are used to you plug in a new fiber channel device, you hit the switch and poof, your hosts see it. Uh, if you've got a zone such the host can see it. Uh, with uh, legacy NVMe over fabrics, if you brought a new storage subsystem into your environment, you had to go to each host and provide the information about where to find the direct discovery controller. When you enable automatic discovery, then that new system will announce itself and the host can go out and do additional work and discover it. Uh, that can be your first step. If you enable centralized discovery, then the new system just registers itself with the centralized discovery system, and the centralized discovery system reports to the new host about the new storage targets that you can talk to, uh, significantly reducing the host complexity. Uh, the MDNS can become excessively chatty in larger configurations, especially when there's more than a thousand ports in a, a single broadcast domain. Uh, so you know, it's good to keep that to uh, just the subsystems talking to the centralized discovery controller. Uh, this is designed so that if you're in an environment where uh, you don't want to use MDNS, you can use standard DNS uh, and you can have your, your DNS server report information about the discovery controllers. Uh, and if you're in an environment that you don't want to do either of those mechanisms, uh, if you have a centralized discovery controller, then you can have, for example, as part of a golden image, a setup for here's here's how to find my central discovery controller, an IP address like you, just like you would set up an IP address for a DNS server, uh, and with just that one uh, address of a centralized discovery controller, storage can come and go, and all of your hosts can find it. So what we've talked about. 
the discovery and but what actually gets reported in discovery uh, and in the discovery process we report something that's called discovery information and you know, we've talked a bunch about the first step here uh, with the administrator configures a path to the discovery system uh, or that may be using auto discovery and you find your discovery subsystem the host connect to the discovery controller and they report these log pages so in this example we're showing a large nvme storage system that contains a bunch of nvm subsystems uh, so if you're new to nvm express nvm subsystem is the term that we use to describe an nvme device that provides storage uh, in 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 common terms you know it's a nvme ssd if you're talking direct attached storage if you're talking a more complex storage subsystem it's a virtualized nvme uh, ssd that provides storage for the system so in this storage subsystem we've got a bunch of nvm subsystems and the discovery system has this log page with a bunch of log entries that just lists all of the different subsystems in the the larger storage system there's a couple other things that can go in here we won't go into uh, with the time we have today but that's the key thing it reports log pages that contain pointers to the subsystems that a host can access and you know, as we've talked a, a little bit about here's kind of a graphical presentation uh, for connecting directly to direct discovery controllers scaling can become a problem if you've got n hosts and you've got n subsystems uh, you've got n times m discovery connections and this this grows as your configuration gets larger uh, so the solution is we're talking about today is we've defined the centralized discovery controllers uh, that's this NVMe Express standardized model for cooperating discovery controllers as already introduced to find in uh, TP8010 with the single fabric entity that aggregates information. It defines an API for sharing information between uh, centralized discovery controllers and direct discovery controllers uh, and how that information is shared with hosts. So now you can have a single location for the storage systems to register, single location for the host to query. We did add a little bit of enhanced new functionality that hosts can take advantage of and storage systems can take advantage of. There's now a mechanism for hosts to register some host information into uh, either the centralized discovery controller or the direct discovery controller, depending on your configuration. And as you'll hear in just a little bit, we have defined a mechanism for fabric zoning. One question we get a lot is, what does this mean for hosts? You know, I've got my Linux host, my VMware host uh, that already understands how to find specific devices. Does, do things have to change dramatically? Uh, no, this is a clean evolution of the existing host discovery. The centralized discovery controller uh, reports available NVM subsystems using the exact same discovery log pages that hosts are already configured to understand with the same host specific uh, accessible NVM subsystem filtering that's allowed. So a, a host that understands NVMe over Fabric's 1.0 discovery controllers can connect to a centralized discovery controller, read out the discovery log pages, and uh, understand all of the basic information to uh, connect to the systems behind it. We create a little bit of enhanced information that is new, but the you know it's it's things the host can take advantage of. They don't have to. Uh, and as we mentioned, the host is now able to register with the centralized discovery controller if that functionality is implemented in the host. So here's a graphical presentation of that. It's the exact same discovery information. It's just centralized. It gets aggregated. And, and your centralized discovery controller has a bigger log page that has uh, aggregated discovery information from a whole bunch of uh, other NVM storage systems that you're connected to, uh, which then that leads to with uh, the centralized discovery controller that your scaling is dramatically simplified. All your hosts just have to find the one centralized discovery controller and uh, your storage just has to register with the 
one centralized discovery controller. And so that's a quick introduction to the centralized discovery and the automatic discovery. Uh, with that, I will hand it over to Claudio to tell us about the NVMe over fabric fabric zoning capabilities. Thank you, Curtis. So let's get to discuss a little bit about the zoning part. So both Eric and Curtis explained to us how the introduction of the centralized discovery controller simplifies the problem of discovery. We have our this exemplary IPSAN, a set of M host and storage devices. And when you are in this configuration, using a centralized discovery controller makes simpler for the host to discover all the storage that is present in a fabric. And we and Eric and Curtis also say there are other ways to perform the discovery. The centralization is not the only way which you can get to this information, but still the point is up to now, each host will be able to discover every storage device that is present in this fabric, in this IP sun. But if you are familiar with Faber Channel, you know that this is not what you want. You don't want each host to discover everything in the fabric. You want to specify some connectivity constraints. You want to say, okay, host A can connect to a certain set, so to a certain number of subsystems. Host D can connect to a certain set of subsystems, and so on. And so you want this discovery process to be actually tailored to the connectivity constraints that you want to implement over this IP sign. This is very familiar to Faber Channel, and we need to do something like that over also on an NVMe over IP SAN in order to achieve a similar functionality. This is where the presence of the CDC makes a big difference in respect to when that is not present. Because once you have a centralized discovery controller, here, now you have a place, a single place, where you can manage these connectivity constraints, making that simple for an administrator to manage. And that single place is the one that will be able to enforce these connectivity constraints by subsecting the discovering information that each host will be able to retrieve from the CDC. So, Let's look at how this works. How can we specify these connectivity constraints and how the system works? First of all, we support two management mode for, uh, for zoning to specify connectivity constraints. Zoning resides on the centralized discovery controller. Over there, you have your zoning database where you have the connectivity constraints expressed. And you can access this database through two interfaces, two, in two ways. One is centralized management that act directly over the CDC. The other way is what is called subsystem-driven zoning, in which while you are managing storage access on the subsystem tree, and as an example, from a management standpoint, you can say, oh, host A can access namespace uh, alpha, host C can access namespace uh, beta, or so on. The fact that these two hosts are able to access certain namespaces of these storage subsystems means that these two hosts has been, have to be able to connect with that storage subsystem. And so from the namespace allocation to host, it becomes possible to uh, define connectivity constraints. The storage can define these connectivity constraints from the management, uh, from the namespace management that you do directly on the subsystem and provide these connectivity constraints, this zoning configuration to the centralized discovery control that will take care of proper enforcement of that. So how do we express connectivity constraints? The general model is this one. We have a zoning database where we have two sub databases, what we call zone DB config and zone DB active. Zone DB config is intended to perform configuration of zone groups. And the zone group is the unit of enforcement that we have to express connectivity constraints. So here you can have multiple zone groups and multiple zone aliases. We will go through these uh, in the following slides. And at zone DP active is instead the list of the enforced zone groups. We have these uh, 
same configuration if you are familiar with Faber Channel and Faber Channel, where you have the active zone set, which is the zone set enforced at the moment by the fabric, or various non-active zone sets. And it's good to have this configuration because maybe you can have uh, a certain access for backups uh, sometimes in the night or a certain time, but uh, then your normal operation for storage instead during the day is different. So you can have multiple zone groups and you can activate which one is at a different time of the, of the day. That's the reasoning for this infrastructure. So what is a zone group? A zone group, as I said, is the unit of activation. So it's the set of connectivity constraints that can be enforced by the CDC. And a very important point about a zone group is that it is how it is identified. We, it is uniquely identified by a pair, zone group name and zone group originator. Zone group name is just a alphanumeric string up to 30 bytes. The zone group originator is the NQN of the CDC, if the zone group was created or configured on the CDC. And of the NVM, NVM subsystem that created it, if instead it was created in an NVM subsystem. So remember the two zoning model that we have. Centralized management of zone groups, the zone group which is centrally management will have a zone group originator, which is the unique QN of the CDC. If instead a zone group is created on a subsystem and passed to the CDC by subsystem driven zoning, then the zone group originator and QN will be the NQN of the MVM subsystem that created. And inside a zone group, you have the identifier and then just a list of zones, a set of zones that are there. Zones are the unit of access control, so a list of NVMe entities that are allowed to communicate. Very simple definition, very similar, if you're familiar with Faber Channel, very similar to that. We have a zone name that I allow to identify a zone, and just a number of zone members as a set of zone members, and we can have some zone properties, that is for future expansion maybe. Finally, we have a zone aliases, something again that we borrow from the Faber Channel world. Zone alias, what is the part of a zone alias? Suppose that in your fabric you have a cluster of 256 uh, hosts that all be behave in the same way because they are a cluster, they, are, uh, they have just distributed application running on top of that and so on, and they all need the same connectivity constraints in order to access the storage. Rather than having to list all the 256 NQMs in a zone definition, I can create an alias that group all these uh, and QNs, and now at this point, whenever I need to do a zoning definition, I use the alias too as an identifier for my cluster of host that I have. So, and finally, what are the members that we put there? As I say, in, in NVMe, the fundamental identifier of an endpoint can be a host, can be a subsystem, is the NQN. So as you can see, most of these zone members types that we define it have the NQN as the main thing. But suppose that a storage device has more than one interface, or, the ho or a host has more than one interface, then you might want, in the moment in which you configure a connectivity constraint just by NQN, basically you say any port of the host or any port of the storage can be used to connect to each other. If you want to have a more granular uh, definition of which connectivity constraint you want to do, well, then you have the possibility to specify, let's look at, uh, look, specify, look at the second type, the IP address and the protocol type that you are using, or the IP, the protocol type, and the, the, as an example, the TCP protocol port that you have there, or you can put the port ID. You can select using the address family. You have to say, oh, if you connect, if you use IPv4, you go in this, uh, you use this port. If you use IPv6, use this other port. So we have all these possibility in a sense to specifically identify, okay, I want to specify a connectivity constraint between this port of host A and this port of storage 3. That's basically what I can have. And as you can see, in terms of the zone aliases, I can put the same numbers except the zone alias itself, because that is what will be then resolved when I go to enforce the uh, zone group. 
Observe that each of these members are actually a pair of things. We have a set of information that identify a port or an endpoint, and then we have the role of this endpoint. That is a very important thing that we introduced that differentiate NVMe zoning, fabric zoning from fabric channel zoning. So each member needs to have a role, and role can have, have two, one of two values, can be a host or subsystem. And so the members of a zone may communicate with each other according to the following very simple rules. Host can communicate with subsystem, subsystem can communicate with host, but hosts are not allowed to communicate with hosts, and subsystem cannot be communicated with subsystem. And not well, the role is something that we specify in each member, which means it's not what you are that determines what is the connectivity constraint, is how you act at a certain point. Example, suppose you have two subsystems and you want to have some data replication from one NVM subsystem to another NVM subsystem. In order to do this sort of backup of data replication, one of the two subsystems has to act as a host. And so in this way, I have the possibility to create a zone in which I specify, okay, now this subsystem is acting as the role of host. This other subsystem is acting as the role of subsystem. Connectivity is allowed within them. They can connect and they can perform their data replication activity. So the role is explicitly defined in order to allow full management control on connectivity constraints. So how do we use these things? Let's go back to our example fabric and suppose that this is the type of connectivity that you want to say. Again, we don't want to get uh, everyone to be able to connect everywhere, but we want to say, okay, host A is able to connect to storage 1, 2, 4, and 5. Host B and C and D are able to connect to storage 3, and host E can connect to 4 and 5. Okay, that is what I want. If I was, uh, if people are familiar with Faber Channel, if I was within Faber Channel, how would I express something like that? I would need to have this zone definition. I need to define a set of two members zone, so zone alpha from A, host A and storage one, zone beta from host A and storage two. Epsilon phi and eta are three zones for to allow connectivity with host B, C, and D with storage 3. And then I will have zone delta and zone gamma that still allow the connectivity of host A with storage 5 and 4, and zone lambda and mo to allow host E to connect with storage 4 and storage 5. And I can call this zone set, let's say zone set row. And when I'm going to do look at what is the Faber Channel zoning configuration. Okay, I define a zone set, it's called ROM. The zone name has, has this set of Greek letters and inside I have my typical two member zone configuration, one host, one storage. Issues here is, as I say, this is a monolithic access control configuration. Everything is, is inside a single zone set. And uh, of course we can see that the zones alpha, beta, gamma, lambda, and beta, and mu are centrally managed. Probably epsilon, phi, and eta are probably generated by the storage tree. If I need to change something, and the administrator to change the entire zone set, as an example, to remove zone delta, in the moment in which there is something that has been generated by storage tree using what we call peer zoning over there, well, we need to be out very careful to not destroy what is there. How would I express the same connectivity constraint in NVMe OF fabric zone? I can div divide my set, my zone set now in three independent zone groups that are independently enforceable. And so I could have a zone group Florence, which is centrally managed on the CDC. Over there, I define a zone, zone A. And in zone A, I have host A, storage 1, Q, 4, and 5. I can define a zone group PISA with NQ and storage 3. So this is coming from storage 3 as is a subsystem driven zoning zone group. And now over there, I will have one zone, I call it zone B, that groups these three hosts and storage 3. And finally, I can have a zone group Siena 
with NQN CDC, which has been centrally managed. You can see how that zoning, the administration model goes straight in the identification of the zone groups. And in this zone group, I put host E, storage five and storage four in a zone that I call zone C. And so this is everything I need in order to get there. And if you don't know what Florence here and Pisa are, I strongly suggest you take a trip to Tuscan. But coming back to our zone groups, okay, what is the definition that we have? Zone name A, we will have a zone numbers host A, which is a host, and then the three, four storages have the role of subsystem. In the zone group Pisa, I just have the three host, we can see the mention of the host as host, and storage three is a subsystem. And host D, again, has the role of host, storage four and five, they are two subsystems. We don't need any more two membered zones. And now if I needed to remove host A access from storage five, I just need to update this zone group. I don't need to touch these two other things. Specifically, I don't need to touch from a central management, the zone group that has been autonomously generated by MVM subsystem three. And so, how that would work. Ah, and then an important point, what does it mean to set up this connectivity? Everything that Curtis and Eric were mentioning to you about the discovery without zoning means OSI gets a disco sends an issue, a get discovery log page command to the CDC. And what comes back, the CDC says, this is all the storage that is available on the fabric. This is not what we want, as we said. We want a zone. We want to say, oh, see us to see only storage three. Once zoning is enforced by the CDC, when the host sees send the same get discovery log page command to the CDC, the CDC will return to the host C only storage three, which is what in the connectivity constraint configuration we are trying to implement, we want host C to be able to see. So, Let's imagine now, as we say, that we want to update the connectivity. And let's consider exactly the example we say. We want to remove a connectivity from host A to storage file. We want to remove that line, that connectivity. Means the zone configuration that we defined, now we need to update the zone A in zone group Florence from there to here. We need to remove zone storage file from zone A which means in terms of configuration, we just need to remove this item from the definition of zone A and then reactivate the update the zone group Florence. Okay, no other zone groups are completely unaffected by this thing and we get the new uh, connectivity configuration that we wanted. What are the associated actions? Let's look at what happens when we are looking at the fabric. You have the CDC and you want, and basically you update zoning on the CDC in order to remove this connection. Once the new updated the zone group Florence get activated on the CDC, the CDC will send an asynchronous event notification to the host. The host will issue a get discovery log page command because this asynchronous event notification will notify the host that there has been changes on the discovery log page for that host. The host issue a get discovery log page, and now we get a new set of storage. Before, host A, when did the discovery, would have got as a response to the get discovery log page command, storage one, storage two, storage four, and storage five. Now it gets only storage one, storage two, and storage four. It means this connection has now to be removed, has to be disconnected. And so this is the host behavior that the host has to implement in this way. Discover, a host discover the subsystem to connect to, by issuing a get discovery log page command to the CDC. The CDC replies with the list of the subsystems available to the host according to the current connectivity constraints, according to the current fabric zoning configuration that the CDC is enforcing. When an administrative action causes the fabric zoning configuration to change, the CDC will send an AM to the host, notify that discovery information changed. The host will issue a get discovery log page command to the CDC. 
the CDC will have an updated discovery log page. And now we are looking at what are the discovery log page entries there. If the updated discovery log page entry contains entries for additional subsystems, so I enlarge the connectivity domain of the host, the host should connect to the newly announced subsystem. If the updated discovery log page instead does not contain any more entries for some subsystem, the host is already connected to the host and should disconnect from that those subsystem. And if hard zoning is implemented, as you know from Fiber Channel, well, the fabric would take care of this disconnection. In this case, the host can orderly take care of the disconnection once uh, we'll define a way for the CDC to enforce uh, hard zoning also here. The fabric can help the host to be disconnected. And this behavior of the host, of course, can be configured. An example of host implementation that enables to do all these steps is, uh, is NVMe Stars, which is an uh, open source implementation of, for Linux of the, of the NVMe OF discovery protocols, implement both TP8009 and TP8010 and supports these connectivity configuration changes due to fabric zoning that I just described. And make them configurable, basically, in order to be sure that if you want to behave, uh, let's say, as a legacy host in which you did not have fabric zoning interacting with you, you can still do that. But uh, uh, moving forward is much better if you obey to the fabric. So how does it work? This is the structure. We have uh, the Avahi daemon, which is a conventional Linux service discovery that perform MDNS. Uh, we have uh, MDNS discovery that is enabled to discover the CDCs and the TDCs. Then we have the UDFD, is the user space device daemon that enable to relay kernel events to application, all these standard Linux. Then we have the staff D, the store appliance finder daemon. This is the main guy that is implementing TP8009. The purpose of this uh, daemon is uh, implement the automated discovery that Curtis and uh, Eric uh, explained before, which is defined by the technical proposal 8009. And so locate discovery controller, connect to the discovery controllers, uh, retrieves get discovery log pages, uh, maintain a cache of the discovery log pages, monitors asynchronous even notification and refresh this cache. And in case something changes, we'll send some discovery log page change and notification over the standard Linux DBAS to the stack D, the secondary demo, that the connector demo, that instead is responsible to set up the IO connections to all the MVM subsystems, to the real storage. So what the stack D does, relieve the list of storage appliances, the list of uh, endpoints to connect from the stack D cache, set up the IO connections to the storage appliances, and monitor and react to the discovery log page changes, and as I said, reacts to discovery log page entry changes that result from connectivity configuration changes or from fabric zoning changes, and is able to add or remove IO connections on demand as necessary according to the fabric zoning configuration. And finally, you have a couple of utility programs that provide information from these two demands. So with that, I think we finished the, the fundamental information we wanted to provide. We are open for questions. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, and just a note for the audience, please feel free to submit any questions you have via the chat box and we'll get through as many as we have time for. Uh, the first question that we received was, how can hosts auto-discover CDC? Through MDNS. Uh, sorry. <laughs> So uh, through MDNS, um, the TP8009 defines no how you can use um, both both uh, MDNS and DNS to get the IP address of the CDC. Okay. Yep. So the same discovery mechanism 
for both the CDCs and the DDCs. You just get uh, get information in the the MDNS response whether which type you've found, and host doesn't actually have to care. Next question I see is, uh, can you explain what a CDC is? I imagine it is a virtual machine. Well, a CDC is a centralized discovery controller, as we say, is an entity that you reach through an IP address. You that you have IP connectivity, in a sense, you don't care much what it is, the, the way in which, the way you care is really how how you reach that entity and which kind of service that is there. So packaging is really not a problem. The current implementation that we have, as an example, in the of a CDC is a virtual machine, but it could be something that goes into, you can embed this functionality inside, switches into the fabric, if you like, or you can put, if you have a set of applications that use containers and so on, it could be a containerized application that, again, you put somewhere in your fabric. Uh, or if you want that it is in your fabric, can be in a separate place as long as you have IP connectivity. Again, hey, that's really... It is a, a piece of software, there is nothing to say about that, that is running somewhere and is providing some services. And can it be high available? Yeah, there are multiple ways in which you can replicate the functions using, again, a CDC is a discovery controller. A controller is something that has an NQN that defines the identity and a set of IP addresses. So you can easily see multiple IP addresses that provide the same service, or redundancy behind a single IP address is also possible. So uh, redundancy of the service is a high availability, can be achieved in multiple ways to be sure that you have a robust solution. Yeah, in including multiple instances. Uh, you know, I mean, Claudia Correct. mentioned that you could have a, a single IP address or multiple IP addresses pointing to the same CDC, but we can also have multiple um, unique CDCs for SAN A, SAN B. So that also gives us another another um, form of resiliency built into what we've proposed. Yeah, and NVM Express today has not defined specific resiliency techniques. It was uh, d designed in that we needed to make sure that the mechanism we designed was compatible with a variety of existing uh, high availability mechanisms for uh, services that are presented with an IP address. Great. Um, and then the next question here, are DDCs required in a given subsystem in order to enable or feed a CDC? No. Um, actually, the Dell's implementation of a CDC allows an end user to manually define um, uh, end endpoints. So it could be a host or a subsystem. It could even be a DDC if you wanted to, but you could manually define those entities, add them to the name server database on the CDC, and then um, you know get your get get your get your entries populated that way. Um, but yeah, generally yeah. speaking, but generally speaking, a, a DDC would be the would be the ideal way that you would have a a subsystem interacting with the CDC. Yeah, and the standard implementation for uh, NVMe over Fabrics 1.0 implementations were that. Uh, virtually all of the uh, NVMF 1.0 implementations provided uh, one or more NVM subsystems and a DDC, as we're now calling it, that could describe those and could be used for discovery controller. Uh, we saw a lot of instances where they were one to one. There would be a, a DDC that only was reporting a single NVMe over fabric subsystem behind it. Uh, so, in, in most cases, the DDCs are going to be there, and, and it's a fairly uh, minor addition to those to the capability of those existing discovery controllers for them to be able to, to register into a, a CDC because we used the existing uh, data information formats. Right. Next question, um, can DDC be turned off at the subsystem so a host is blocked from going direct if CDC is used? Uh, not, uh, we, we don't, we don't uh, disable the DDC on the subsystem. Um, we, we, you know, we would always allow a host to connect to the discovery controller on our subsystems uh, and, you know, 
And so it would really be up to the subsystem though, to say, um, you know, I, to filter the information that it sends back to that host and say, okay, host, you're either allowed to communicate with these subsystem interfaces or none. Um, and both of those responses are perfectly fine. So even if a host gets access to a DDC, it's really up to the DDC to determine what gets returned to that specific host. Um, another sort of subtle point here is that um, when, when you have a, a, a DDC that's, in, that's interoperating with or interacting with is probably, probably a better way of saying it, interacting with the CDC, um, you know, we, we have our direct discovery controllers become non-responsive to MDNS requests. So effectively, if you have a CDC in your environment, you're only interacting with that CDC, not the DDCs. Um, so that's, that's how we get around the, the MDNS challenge. Curtis, your yeah. audio, you have anything you want to say? No, you, you nailed it. And that's the, the model yeah, that it was defined in the specification is that that uh, auto discovery to, to DDCs that are registered with the CDC should be turned off. So you, know, you, could, you don't necessarily have to turn off the, the DDC. OK, and then the next question here, this might end up being our last question. Uh, with the CDC implemented in the IP network, if a host discovers the IP address of a storage NVM subsystem discovery controller through MDNS or DNS, what mechanism enforces blocking the connection if the host attempts to connect to the storage NVM subsystem if there is no defined, if there is no zone defined in the active zone set in the CDC for this connection? This is the question about the hard zoning versus soft zoning. Right at the moment, what has been defined in the CDC is a soft zoning. We saw it's filtering through discovery. Uh, how can you implement this? How can, can you make it is a hard zoning uh, similar to what uh, Faber channels which is do today? You need, in a sense, to interact with uh, the with the switches in the fabric uh, so that they can translate the zoning configuration, the connectivity constraints expressed by the uh, zoning, fabric zoning configuration in IP level ACLs that basically say this uh, connection is allowed or this one is not allowed. And for that, there is no standard defined uh, yet. There is no standard interface. It's something we might decide to tackle uh, sooner or later in MVM Express and see how we can get there. But there are certainly vendor specific ways in which you can uh, basically tackle in, uh, in, in ways in which different switch vendors provide these capabilities. And so basically you just interact from your fabric zoning configuration at the CDC level to what your uh, uh, IP fabric is able to do in order to limit connectivity. Okay, I, I think there, there's a possible, uh, another question in there that you know, the, if the, a uh, host discovers a direct discovery controller on a subsystem when you've got fabric zoning running. You know, for example, if you've gone in and, and hard coded that I know there's a storage subsystem direct discovery controller out at IP address 1234, um, the knowledge of that direct discovery controller can is can, the host can connect to that discovery controller, but that direct discovery controller only tells the host what storage behind that direct discovery controller is available to that host. So that direct discovery controller ideally will be aware of the zoning configuration and will report a subset of the available targets that the CDC would report. That, that um, direct discovery controller would be filtering with the same zoning rules. Yeah, I, I agree with what with what Curtis just said and Claudio just said. I would just add one little piece to it is that you typically have zoning and namespace or LUN masking. You call it namespace masking with NVMe. Um, but so you would have two ways of controlling access. And, and so the question says you don't have a zone defined in the CDC, but you would have a, a namespace masking database or functionality at the subsystem that, that would prevent um, an unauthorized host from accessing capacity that they shouldn't be accessing. So, um, and it, but it's it's a it's a fair point that today, 
uh, it, it's primarily soft zoned and name server based zoning. And there, but there are ways to enforce hard zoning, as both have mentioned. Yeah, good clarification, Eric. So the most uh, many systems implement the the masking capability and yep. won't allow connections that are supposed to be prevented, even if the host knows about the device. Great, and with that, we're actually out of time here. So thank you all so much for joining us today. As I mentioned at the beginning, the slides will be available on the MVM Express website, um, and a video recording of this presentation will be available on the MVM Express YouTube channel and Bright Talk channel. Thank you all for joining, and um, thank you, Eric, Curtis, and Claudio for presenting. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.